So good evening everyone. And my name is Alona Navarre by Alona Navarre. And the topic we chose for tonight is the topic that I like calling it the power of modesty. You hear from so many different places about modesty, about sniut, but nobody really goes the extra mile to explain the power of modesty. We know why, but we don't know what's behind it. So first of all, with your permission, I would like to also dedicate this shiur tonight. My grandmother's yard site is tonight. So we're going to dedicate this shiur to be for her elevation of her soul. L'aliyat ha-neshama, l'arita Rachel bat Rivka. Shetiyeh neshmata atzura begin zeh meromim. And I have a special guest tonight. My mother is here and my daughter is here. So they're joining us also tonight. So, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehakol Niyah Bidoro. So you can all hear me, hear me well in the back? Yeah. Okay. So modesty, we know the biggest mitzvah and the most important mitzvah all women have is modesty. Men have 613 mitzvot to do and women are kind of exempt from most of them. And one of the most important things we know for a woman is modesty. Modesty the way she dresses. Modesty, the way she talks, modesty, the way she thinks, the way she behaves, the way she interacts. Modesty is not just putting a long dress. And in many different places we learn so many good things about it, how so many brachot come from modesty, how so many women, how they when decided to become more modest, they were blessed with finding a husband, blessed with kids, blessed with parnasah. And you know, we know from so many places, in all the Torah, and all the beautiful oral Torah that we have, and all the Midrashim, and the Talmud, there's so many stories about so many tzaddikim, how they were brave, how they, Masru uh, Nefesh, they died for the name of Hashem, and so many other things. But in all the Torah, and in all the oral Torah, when it's talking about any of the women, it's only talking about the same thing, modesty. You do not hear in the Torah or any other story about other things besides the first paid matriarch, our mother Sarah. The first thing he was talking about it, how, uh, about her, how she was modest. It doesn't say that she was smart. It doesn't say how great of a prophet she was. She was greater than Abraham. She was greater than Abraham Avinu. But it doesn't state in the Torah that she was a great prophet. It states in the Torah that she was modest. Same with, with Rivka, our next mother. She was also a great prophet. And it doesn't say how great of a prophet she was or what wisdom she had. It describes that she was modest. When Eliezer brought her on the camel and she saw Yitzchak praying, the first thing she did, she covered herself. And all the rest of the women that we read, whether it's in the Torah, in the oral Torah, in the Jewish history, it's always pointing the great attribute of modesty in a woman. And many, many places we can find how the source of all the blessing comes from the modesty. From a very, very simple explanation. Because the woman is the queen. Woman is like a diamond. When you have something that is very valuable, very precious, you hide it. You don't walk around in the street showing everybody the diamond that you have, you put it in a safe, you hide it. You don't want anybody to look at it. But beyond all this information that we already know, I'm not uh, giving you any new information up till now, but tonight I kind of want to talk, even, so, even though it's such a long topic, I want to try to touch more of a, a, a mystical part of the modesty, what the Zohar, the holy book of Zohar has to say about modesty, what Hasidic philosophy teaches us about modesty. And we see that it all started like all the stories in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eve, when Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava were created. And it says in the Torah that in the beginning they were naked. And it says, they weren't, they weren't shy. 
because there wasn't still that level of impurity. But how did it all start? The Midrash teaches us that the Nachash, the snake, he looked at Adam and Chava when they were together, and the snake wanted Chava. That's why he came in all sorts of tricky way to trick her, because he wanted to marry her. He wanted to have Chava for himself. That's why we, we learn in many different reasons, ways why, but we see that in the beginning, Chava's name was Chaya. Later on, her name was changed to Chava. And the thing is that when the snake made them sin, then Adam, he kind of dumped Chava. He sent her away. He didn't want to be with her. He was very upset at her. Then came the Nachash, and he told Chaya, you know, my name in Aramaic, Nachash, is Chivya. So he told Chava, my name is Chivya, you are my wife, so your name should be Chava, not Chaya. Kabbalah explains that her name, the middle letter of her name is Yud, and with the sin she actually pulled down the Yud into the Klipot, which made the Yud look like a Vav. That's why her name was changed also to Chava. But that's where it all started. Later on we know that the first two kids that were born to Adam and Chava were Cain and Heaven. But they were also born, each one with a twin. Cain was born with one twin, and Hevel was born with two twins, two twin women. And we know that Cain killed Hevel because of the offering, because Hashem didn't look at his offering. Yeah, that's what's called on the surface. Really what happened is, Cain looked at Hevel's sister, because they were mating. Cain was born with a sister to mate, to procreate. And Hevel was born with two sisters to procreate. Provo. And Cain looked at his sister and he wanted her. That's where the fight started. Right after the sin of Adam and Chava, it says in the Torah that Hashem dressed Adam and Chava with garments. Vayalbishem kutnot or. It says or with ayin. Or with ayin is leather. Like he dressed them with some type of a garment. The thing is that Kabbalah explains that since they were dirty with the sin, then they got dressed with what's called mashcha dechivya, the skin of the snake, of the impurity. That's why the skin is, it says, could not or be ayin, with ayin, because it was like a skin. More than that, the reason why Hashem dressed them is because they brought the impurity down to the world. They brought the whole concept of immorality and impurity. And since then, till this day, we're suffering. And this is the main thing that we have to fix. In the beginning, we know the Shechina, the godly revelation, was in this world in Gan Eden. The second that Adam and Chava sin, Nistalka Shechina. The Shechina just left this world. Then came the next sin of Cain and Hevel. So the Shekhinah went from the first sky, from the first Rakiah, La Rakiah Sheni, to the second heaven. Then came the second sin of Shet, went to another Rakiah. And every generation came, made another sin, Dora Flaga with the, with the flood. And every sin, the Shekhinah went one more Rakiah. We know we have seven Rakiim, seven heavens. Later on came Avraham Avinu, the first Tzaddik after two generations, two major generations, and he brought the Shekhinah from the Rakiah Shvi to Rakiah Shishi. He brought the Shekhinah down. Then came Yitzchak, brought it down one more Rakiah. Then came Yaakov, brought it one, one, one more Rakiah. And the last one who brought it, Mirakiah El Haaretz, was Moshe Rabbeinu. He went up to the mountain, and he brought the Shekhinah from the Rakiah, Laaretz. Then came Chet Egel, Shekhinah again, Nistalka. Again the Shekhinah left this world. And then came the Chet of the Meraglim, and then came all the rest of the sins, and the Shekhinah went again up. And it's in our hands to bring the Shekhinah down. So now that we kind of covered how it started, then now we're going to start learning how we can fix it. So we know that at some point after Matan Torah, the Shekhinah left the world, 
And it's in our hands to start bringing down the Shekhinah down. Now, I kind of want, it's a, such a broad topic that it's so hard to cover in such a short class. But I'm going to try and touch the most important things from many different sources. Now, modesty in Hebrew is called Tzni'ut. It says in the Torah, Vehatzne alechet. You should go modesty, Mashem Elokecha. You should be modest. Also men are, are, are commanded to be modest. But we see, and I'm going to get to it in many different parts of the night, but the whole concept of tzniyot, of modesty, has a very strong connection to the holiday of Purim. And I'm going to get to it at the end, how it's all connected. And we know that the biggest mitzvah on Purim is you have to get drunk ad de lo yada. Till you get to a level that you can't distinguish between the evil Aman and the holy Mordechai. The holy book of Zohar is talking about it in many different places and we're going to try to connect all the dots tonight how the holiday of Purim is connected to Tzniot. We know that in the spiritual realm, there's many different sfirot, many different le levels, godly revelations. The highest level of all the sfirot, the Zohar calls it Ad de lo yada. The Zohar also calls it Tzni'uta. Tzni'uta means Hester, that you can't see. This is the first connection to Purim, because the famous character is Esther. Why is it not called? Why is it not called Megillat Mordechai? Mordechai did everything. Seemingly, it seems like he did everything. Why is it not called Megillat Purim or anything else? It's called Megillat Esther. Why? For many, many reasons. This is not a sure about Purim, but main reason is that in the entire Megillah we don't find one time the name of Hashem. It says Hamelech. It doesn't say any of the names of Hashem. Why? Because the entire Megillah conceals the whole concept of Purim, coming from the name Esther. The name of the Queen Esther, her name was, her name was, uh, was Hadassah. Her name was what, not Esther. So the first connection we already see is that in the Megillah, everything is concealed, mainly the name of Hashem. And we know that Hashem's names are the way Hashem interacts with the world. The way Hashem shows Himself to the world is named by a name. And in Hebrew, in Lashon Kodesh, it's called Gilui. Every time Hashem wants to lead Galot, to reveal Himself, He reveals Himself with some type of a garment. And this garment is called by a name. So when Hashem wants to reveal Himself in the garment of mercy, corresponds to Hashem's name, Yud K Vav K. This is the name of Rachamim. When Hashem wants to show Himself in the attribute of judgment, of Din, He shows Himself in the name Elohim. And there's many different names, Shin Dalet Yud, Kel Shaddai, Aleph Dalet Nun Yud. Each name corresponds to one garment that God dresses Himself in this world to reveal Himself. In Megillat Esther, in the Megillah of Purim, there's no name of Hashem, there's a hester, there's a concealment. The Zohar calls the highest level in all the Sfirot, Ad de Loyada. Same thing, the Zohar is also calling it Tzni'uta, which means hester, concealed, you don't see anything. The same level is also called in the Zohar Emuna, belief. This is the highest level one can reach in serving Hashem. You can know Hashem, you can understand Hashem, you can uh, uh, maybe feel, but the highest level is emunah because it's blind. You don't, you, you don't based on anything. It's just emunah, pure belief in Hashem. Now, the Zohar calls the Midat HaTzniyut this Ad de Yada. And the Zohar continue and talks about it in many different places, but in the concept of Kabbalah, 
Kabbalah always explains that everything in this world has to have a vessel and everything in this world has a light and everything every time that we want to hold something it needs a vessel if I want now excuse me vessel the clay Kabbalah explains in a depth way the concept of or light and clay vessel if I want to have now a cup of water I need a ve I need a vessel I want the cup of tea I need a vessel I go to shopping I have a lot of fruit with me I need a vessel to put it in so everything of course corresponds from the the spiritual realm so even in the spiritual realm has to have a vessel to every godly revelation every time God wants to reveal himself he reveals himself in what's called in the language of Kabbalah or light so in this level there's also what's called a kli a vessel and there's also what's called a light when Hashem wants to reveal himself he reveals himself with, the, with this godly light so it, the Zohar says that even in that level the level of Adeloyada of Tzni'uta of this Hester there's also a godly light it's concealed, but there's also a kli for that. And this kli, this vessel, is what's holding this light. And the reason why I'm telling you that, because later on I'm going to explain to you why this kli corresponds to the tzniyot. Now, the Zohar, and in many different places, it compares tzniyot to emunah. Tzniyot, modesty, to trust, to believe. Now this is in very short what the Zohar is talking about modesty. Now I want to talk about a little bit more what the Hasidut talks about modesty because it explains it in a very very special way. Now we know it says in the Torah right after Matan Torah we read it a few weeks ago that it says Vasitem li mikdash v'shachanti betocham Now it says betocham in Hebrew means, the translation of the verse means, and you should do for me a mishkan, a dwelling place, and I will dwell in them, but it says betocham in a plural, not in single. Technically it should say, vasitim li mikdash, and you should build me a sanctuary, and I will dwell in him, betocho. And why does it say it plural, betocham? So the Midrash says, since it's talking about plural, betocham, must be that it's referring to each and every one of us. Meaning that Hashem tells us, Ve'asitem li mishkan, you should build your sanctuary, which should be your body, ve'shachanti betocham, and I will dwell in you. So this is one of the fundamental mitzvot that we have, that we are, our body, is a mishkan for Hashem, a dwelling place for Hashem. My body, my house, my business, everything, my mind, my mouth, everything is a mishkan la Hashem. And Hashem says, if you build me a mishkan, a mishkan is a, tabernacle it's a holy place if you build it the right way and it will be holy and it would be perfect and clean and pure and I'll dwell in you so it's not only building a beautiful Beit Mikdash also my house is a Mishkan so if my house is a Mishkan a dwelling place then God will dwell in it if my mind is a Mishkan Hashem will dwell in that if my business is a Mishkan then Hashem will dwell there too so our entire avodah, our entire job is to build a mishkan for the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Now it says in the Torah that the mishkan, there's a very big difference between mikdash and mishkan. Mishkan is a temporary place and mikdash is the place keva. It's the holy temple in Yerushalayim. So in, the, in Egypt, in, the, in the, the Midbar, in the desert, they had the mishkan. When they entered Eretz Israel, they still had the Mishkan. So it explains in the Torah that the Mishkan had two major things in it. It had the Kelim, all the vessels, all the Kelei Kodesh, and it had what's called the Yeriyot HaMishkan, the sheets that were covering the Mishkan. The Kelim, this is what's called Pnimi, because it was hidden in the Mishkan, in the tent, nobody saw it. Only Moshe Rabbeinu and the Kohanim were able to see the Kelim. The Kelim means the Kiyo, they had a, 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 a sink. They had all sorts of things to, to, to uh, uh, how do you say it in English? Like, uh, how do you say Magrifa in, uh, in English? Like a, a rake to, 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 
to mix the 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 gechalim of the mikdash, the fire. They had all sorts of tools. Also, there was the menorah. They had all sorts of tools. They were called the kelim tools. Is not really the right translation. But nobody saw them. It was in the Mishkan, only Moshe Rabbeinu saw it, and at the time Aaron, who was the Kohen Gadol, he saw it. So the Kelim corresponds to Torah, because Torah is what's called Pnimiyut, and the Kelim were hidden, they were Pnimiyut, in the oil. But the sheets, the Yeriot, they were, everybody saw the sheets. Everybody who would go outside of the Mishkan would see all the sheets. They correspond to the mitzvot. So in our life we have Torah and we have mitzvot. The Torah corresponds to Pnimiyut and the mitzvot corresponds to Chitzoniyut. And the mitzvot are called Levushim, garments, the same way that the sheets, the Yeriot HaMishkans, were garments to the Mishkan. Now, in our life, or should I say more in the spiritual life, the reason why we have the Torah, because the Torah is what's called the Mazon for the soul. When I study Torah, I give my soul food. When I do mitzvot, the mitzvot are the levushim, the garments, that I dress my neshama with levushim. So that's why we need both of them. We need the mitzvot and we need the Torah. So the kelim of the mikdash correspond to the Torah. The yeriot, the sheets, correspond to the mitzvot. Now we know that there are 248 positive mitzvot and they correspond to 248 limbs that we have in our body, but they also correspond to 248 limbs of Hashem. Ramach Evarim de Malka. The 248 limbs of God. Now, Hashem doesn't have limbs. He doesn't have a body. What does it mean? It means that Hashem has 248 powers that he dresses in, himself in, in order to interact in this world. Same way that I have a body, I have hands, I have fingers, I have legs, I want to walk, I need my legs. I want to do something with my hands, I have to use my hands. I want to read, I use my eyes. I want to talk, I use my mouth. I want to eat, I need my, my organs to digest the food. Same way that we have 248 limbs, corresponding to 248 positive mitzvot that we have, these are the 248 limbs of Hashem. Now, the same way that if I'm going to now grab somebody by their hand, or by their shoulder, or by their leg, and I'll pull them towards me, I don't just pull somebody's hand, I pull the entire body. So the same way when I do a mitzvah, then I pull all 248 of these godly limbs. Now, these 248 positive mitzvot, they correspond to the seven types of mitzvot, because we see that when it was talking about in the tabernacle, about the Eriyot Mishkan, these sheets, there were seven. Shet, Argaman, they, they, it, it, it gives the names of them. What did you say? Shani, yeah, it's talking about seven, seven types of yeriot, which corresponds to seven types of mitzvot. The hint in this goes to the seven mitzvot that we have are, that are from the sages, Sheva Mitzvot de Rabbanan. And again, the connection to Purim, we see that the levush, the garment of the Mishkan were the yeriot, these sheets. And in the Megillat Esther, it says that when Haman went to Achashverosh and he told him what should be done to the man that the king loves him the most, then the king says, Vayave et halevush, bring me the garment. Later on we see, we sing it every Purim, Umordechai yatsa, im bigdei hamelech, im bigdei hamelech, belevush malchut. Tehav will see the connection back again. But the 248 garments that Hashem gets dressed in these worlds are these mitzvot. In order for Hashem to interact in this world, He needs garments. The same way that nobody will leave the house without garments, same way Hashem interacts in this world with these garments. So when Hashem told us, V'asidem li mikdash v'shachanti betocham, 
Hashem tells us, build me a mishkan, a sanctuary. But how am I going to dwell in you? Besides making my home or my business or my mind or anything a mishkan, I also have to do mitzvot. I have to do all the mitzvot. Nobody can come and say I'm a very good person and I do only five mitzvot. It's very nice of you that you're a very good person and you do five mitzvot. But we have to do all the mitzvot. The same way that you're not going to drink only water or eat only apples. You eat all the types of food and you eat all sorts of types of nutrition. So the same way we have to do all the mitzvot. The reason we do mitzvot is that every mitzvah that I do, it brings down one piece of this godly revelation that we were talking about before, this Or Eloki. Before I was talking about that we have the godly light and every Or needs a vessel. So up in Shamayim, in the spiritual realms, there's many Orot, what it's called, but we need to have Kelim for that. So Hashem tells us, do mitzvot. So we know we have so many mitzvot. Right now we're concentrating on the 248 positive mitzvot that we have to do. Every mitzvah that I have to do, I have to say before that a bracha. I have to say a blessing. I put filin on, I say asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu l'anech filin. I cover myself with the lit, asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu l'itatev b'tzitzit. I shake a lulav, asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu al netilat lulav. Every Mitzvah that I do from the 248, some not, but I have to say a bracha. Why do I have to say a bracha? Why does the blessing precede the actual mitzvah? So one of the reasons why we say a bracha before we do a mitzvah, because bracha comes from the word hamshacha. When I say a bracha, what do I say? Baruch. Who's baruch? What's baruch? Baruch is blessed. Who's blessed? Ata. Who's ata? Hashem. Who's Hashem? Elokeinu. The God of what? Is the king. King of what? Of this world. So when I say a bracha, I call Hashem and I pull him down to this world. Bracha comes from the world hamshacha. So in order for me to bring down this godly light in the spiritual realm, I have to pull down Hashem into this world. And I pull him down with this bracha. So to go back to what I was talking about before, is that there's this, when Hashem wants to reveal Himself in this world, He reveals Himself in what's called Or, a light. Kabbalah talks about it in many different places, that every time Hashem wants to reveal Himself, it corresponds to Or. Or, not necessarily Or, the translation of Or is light, but it doesn't mean necessarily every time Hashem reveals Himself is necessarily light. Rather, rather comes from the word He'ara, to enlight, to, to, to leha'ir or something, to enlight something. So if I want to bring down Hashem down to this world, then first of all I have to make a vessel. The vessel is the mitzvah. And the bracha is the channel where I pull down Hashem. So when Hashem tells us, yeah, I need to be down in this world. Down here. There's a great question in the Midrash. Why did Hashem create the world? Why, well, what, was, what was wrong up there that He had to create this world? So the Midrash answers, Hashem wanted to have a dwelling place in this place, in this world, in the lowest of the lowest. That's why He created the world. So in order for us to, to, to do the ultimate will of Hashem, is doing Him dira lo itbarach. Hashem wanted a dwelling place in this world, so the ultimate of that Hashem is to prepare this world to be a dwelling place for Hashem. Now if I have a house, and a great king comes to visit and he's going to be staying by me I'm going to clean the house and I'm going to get a cleaning company to sparkle every 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 inch of the house and I'm going to buy the best cups and the best plates and I'm going to make my entire house worthy for the king to walk in same way Hashem says I want to come down to this world make me a dwelling place in this world so the dwelling place is doing our life a mishkan and one of the ways of doing it is by the mitzvot. Because we see that in the Mishkan, the inner part of the Mishkan, the kelim, the vessels, corresponds to Torah, that we have to study Torah. But this is what's called pnimiut. It's something that we don't see. It's hidden. 
But the external part, the garments of the Mikdash, of the Mishkan, were these sheets, these yeriot, which corresponds to the spiritual garments that God dresses Himself. So every mitzvah that we do is one piece of this garment. And every time that I want to fulfill all 248 of these mitzvot, I'm basically creating this vessel for Hashem to get dressed in. So we see from that the great virtue of all the mitzvot. But why only men have to do all the mitzvot? Women are exempt from most of the mitzvot. Men have to put filin, men have to put tzitzit, men have to pray, they have to do all the, most of the mitzvot are for men. Women are exempt from most mitzvot. Why? Why are they exempt from all the, most of the mitzvot? Now it says, it says uh, the, the shiur umuklad, we're going to record it, I'm going to put it online, you'll see it. It says, I lost my chain of thought. Most of the mitzvot men have to do. And there's a question, why are women are exempt from most of the mitzvot? Now, every time that I do a mitzvah, then I pull down one godly light into this world. Now we know the Zohar is calling the mitzvot Tarach Amudim. Tarach means 620. 620 is the 613 mitzvot that we have from the Torah plus the seven mitzvot that the sages gave us. This is 620. But the Zohar calls it Tarach Amudim. 620 pillars. So every time that I do a mitzvah, I create what's called like a pillar, like a tzinor, that the light goes down. So when a man puts on his head filin, He's bringing four lights down to this world because if you look in the parshiot of the tefillin, there's four parshiot inside, in the parchment, there's four. When a man puts the talit, he wraps himself with the talit, he brings one godly light and so forth. Every mitzvah brings one godly light. No, now it's on mute. Every mitzvah that we do is a vessel for one channel of this godly light. So when I do all the mitzvot, then I create all these channels that through my mitzvot, Hashem can dress in this world. And this is the major answer why most people say, why do I have to do all the mitzvot? Give me the, I'll do a few, and I'm a very good person. That's what the most, the, the te'ana that I get in most places, I'm a very good person. I don't steal, I don't lie, I, I, don't, I don't cheat, I don't do this, I don't do that, but I don't need to do all the mitzvot. The, the, all the mitzvot are not for me. No, because if I want to have Hashem get dressed in my mishkan, I have to do all the mitzvot. So here again comes the same question. Why do only the men get the mitzvot? Why the women don't get the mitzvot? So here comes a very interesting explanation. What Hasidut explains is that the woman gets the same power of all the mitzvot by being modest. A man has to do all the mitzvot in order to get this he'ara, this godly light come down to the world and dressed in all these evarim, these, these limbs, spiritual limbs. A woman doesn't have to put filin, she doesn't have to put tzitzit, she doesn't have to do almost anything. You know how a woman achieves the exact same thing? Betzni'uta. What the Zohar is talking about, this high level, where it originates this hester, this concealment. A woman can achieve the exact same thing what a man has to do every day. And I'm not going to name all 248 mitzvot, but the most ones that you know, man has to put filin every day. He has to be covered with talit. He has to do so many other things, build the sukkah, and shake the lulav, and a million other things. A woman can achieve the exact same thing with just by tzniut, by modesty, by reaching to this level of hester, of concealment. The dress when it's long is not to make the woman uncomfortable. 
is to conceal this godly revelation. I need to wear tefillin on my head for a whole hour every day to achieve a godly revelation and to bring down godly light into this world, to create a channel for Hashem to be dressed in this world. And a woman just needs to be modest. That's the difference. But I have to do many mitzvot, and a woman only has to keep one major thing, is the tzniut, is this level that the Zohar is talking about, ad de lo yada. We know that Hashem creates the world with many different tools. We know that Hashem has what's called the Esser Sfirot El Yonot, ten spiritual garments that He gets dressed in. And we know that the lowest level, the lowest Sfirah is called Malchut. Malchut corresponds to a queen, to Malka. And with the Sfirah of the Malchut, Hashem creates the world. But the Sfirah of the Malchut is the garment that Hashem gets dressed in to create the world. Meaning that when Hashem wants to create the world, He gets dressed in the Sfirah of Malchut. And that's how He creates the world. And we see that the main thing of the modesty is the garments. Is the garments that the woman dresses. Now here I want to say another interesting thing, and it really happened in, in a Mamash Ashgacha Prati, that it's that the day of the Shi'ur, our weekly Parsha is Acharei. It's amazing, the Ashgacha Prati. And in this Parasha, it's talking about the service of Yom Kippur. And one of the things that it's talking about is the Sa'ir Lazazel, that there was a man who would be chosen to go out with a goat and then throw him off a cliff and there's the parasha is talking about in in depth all the services of Yom Kippur there's a midrash in, uh, in the Gemara in Masechet Yoma that is talking about that there were two angels that fell from the sky and their name was Uza and Azael and these angels they liked the women, they found the women very attractive. They gave their angelship, Kivyachol, to stay down in this world. And they are the source of that what's called Klipat Haniuf, the, the main power of impurity, of immorality. They brought it down to this world, this Uza and Azael, yes. Angels don't have choice, right? No. I guess they asked Hashem, why? It doesn't say in the Midrash why. It just says that these two angels came down to the world, probably with a mission. They saw what's going on. They went onto Santa Monica Boulevard. <laughs> they saw the women. They were like, I want to stay. Why? It does, the Midrash doesn't say. I don't know. Why would it affect them? That the Midrash doesn't say. I just quote the Midrash. Why they asked, why, why it affected them. My view of it is that everything that happens in the history of our Torah is for somebody down the line to learn something from it. So probably in this time, there was an exception to the rule. And these two particular angels probably did have an option of saying to Hashem, we want to stay here. Why or how, the Midrash doesn't say. The Midrash just says that they came down to this world, they liked the women, and they stayed here, but they only wanted to stay here for causes of immorality, and they brought this klipa, this power, this source of immorality to the world, and up until today, we're fighting it. What's the name again? Uza and Azael. This is, this is the name of two... Azazel. Exactly, that's what I'm saying, that in our parsha it's talking about the Sa'ir Azazel. Bechlal, the, par the, the part of Yom Kippur it's talking about that the main service of Yom Kippur was lechaper, obviously, to a toin, but it's talking how the Kohen had to change his clothes eight times. He had four garments that were gold and four garments that were white. The gold garments correspond to a toining for 
Avodah Zarah, for idol worship, and the four white garments correspond to a toining, lechaper, of arayot, of all the immorality. So the main two sins that were in that time, which is kind of the main two sins in our time, is Avodah Zarah, idol worship. Well, in our generations, we don't bow to idols, but everything around us can be idol worship. People make their car an idol worship. They make their house, their business, their money, everything. Idol worship in Hebrew is Avodah Zarah. Zarah means foreign, which means everything that is foreign for serving Hashem is called Avodah Zarah. So I can point on almost anything in our generation that can be Avodah Zarah. The Torah says that everything can be, everything that is not Torah is Avodah Zarah. So the main two sins that we even have in our generations is Avodah Zarah, which is idol worship, anything that is a, a foreign to Torah, and Giloy Arayot, all the immorality. And in our generation, Hashem Erechem, it's, it's, it's empowered. So even at the time of the Bet HaMikdash and the time of the Mishkan, the main atonement, the main kapara had to be for Avodah Zarah and for Giloy Arayot. And it's talking about with Azazel, with the whole story with the goat, that he had the person who, who it was a goral, it was like a lottery, somebody had to win it, and he would take the goat, throw the goat off the, the cliff. It's more talking about, in a more of a pnimiyut enyanim, the more mystical part of it is that the goat was called a sa'ir, sa'ir l'azazel. And this sa'ir corresponds to Esav, Esav, who was the... The, the Sar Shemekatreg Alam Israel, he's the minister that is prosecutes against uh, 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 the Jews. He's called Seir, Yatsa Seir Ve'admoni. This is talking about Esav. So this Seir corresponds to Esav, and when we go and we throw this uh, goat, this is how we, the, the, the whole point was that the goat, all his limbs would get uh, disattached, and that's how we would break then all the klipot. But what's interesting here, I don't want to sidetrack too much, I just wanted to point out the Ashgaha Potit, how the Shi'ur is done exactly on the Parashat Achrei, that it's talking about the Avodat Yom Kippur. One thing that it's talking about is the whole atonement of the Arayot. And that was done with the white garments. What's amazing here is that what atoned for the sins was a garment. Not anything else. It's talking how the garment atoned for the sin. That's why the Kohen, the high priest, had to change his garments all the time. It's actually talking about that each garment corresponds to something. It's actually talking that the pants, the white pants, were to atone for the immorality, for the arayot. But what's amazing is that we see that what atoned for the immorality was a garment going again back to the whole concept of a garment. And this is what we read in our parasha now this week. So kind of putting it all together is that we see from our parasha, from the whole seder of Yom Kippur, that what atoned for the sins was, was garments. We see that what a woman can achieve with one thing, what men cannot achieve, is with garments. We see that anything, anytime we want to bring down Hashem into the world, we have to create this spiritual garments, the, these mitzvot, it all goes back to the same thing, to a garment. In Kabbalah, there's two concepts of a godly revelation. There's what's called opnimi, an inner light that you don't see, and an or makif, a surrounding light. Everything that has to do with Torah is pnimi, we said before with the Mishkan, and the garments are external, they're or makif. We see that in a, in a wedding, I don't think it's the minhag of all the edot, but in many of the edot, we see that in a wedding, the bride surrounds the groom seven times, mm -hmm. corresponding to the seven days of creation, corresponding to the sheva midot, corresponding to the seven days of their life, much more things. But in the terms of Kabbalah, she's the makif. The isha is the makif, the external part. That's why we say, in Eshet Chayil, Ateret Ba'ala. Ateret is a crown. The wife is the crown to the husband. We've seen many different things. Even the wife, she's the one who gets the ring because she's again, it's an Ateret, it's a Keter. In the Sfirot, the wife is the Malchut. She's the king, she's the queen. Corresponding to Shabbat, Shabbat HaMalka. It says in the time of Mashiach, the 
המלכות תתעלה לדרגה של כתר, זה ספירה או מלכות, הוא go above to the ספירה, what's called כתר, a crown, that's what it's talking about, את אשת חי לתר את בעלה, את הטיים אוף משיח, the woman is going to be the supreme one. Right now it's even, it's in, in revealed. We see a, a beautiful hint to it, is that there's a great question, why when we pray Tfilat Shmona Esra, we pray it whispering, Lachash, it's called Tfilat Alachash. We pray, we, we pray it secret, because this is in the level of Malchut, and the Malchut right now is not revealed, same way that like the woman has to be not revealed, even the Tfilah right now is not revealed. It says, La'atid Lavo, in the times of Mashiach, Tfilat Shmona Esra is going to be out loud. When the Malchut is going to be revealed. It all goes, boils down to the same thing, that the woman corresponds to the Sefirat of the Malchut, and the same way that in the spiritual realm, the Malchut is constantly covered, it's constantly hester, it's constantly covered, it's constantly not revealed. And going back, how I said before, with the connection to Purim all the time, that the Zohar said that the mitzvah of Tzniut is corresponding to Ad Deloyada. And I said before that the Levushim, again the garments, correspond. We said that Mordechai Yatsa Lifnei HaMelech. Mordechai was the king. But who Yatsa Lifnei HaMelech, he came in front of the king. And how did he come out? Belevush Malchut, with the garment of Malchut. So even Mordechai had to get dressed in the garment of Malchut. That's why the entire Megillah is called about Esther, because she was not revealed in the, in the Megillah, but she's the main cause. And going back to the connection of Purim, we know that the, time, the Chag of Purim, it says Ke Purim. That's, that's what we're talking about, Yom Kippur. Going back again to the, what we said about now, the Seder of Yom Kippur, the entire day of atonement. It says that this holiday is like Purim, Ke Purim. So at the highest day of the, the most holiest day of the year, which is, Pur, which is Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, it it's even says it's not really the day, it's like Purim, it's Ke Purim. Meaning that even Purim is a higher level of atonement. It even says that on Yom Kippur you can get a higher atonement than on Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is considered the holiest day of the year. It was decided or designated to be that day because that's the day that Moshe Rabbeinu came down from the mountain. That's the day when Hashem forgave the Jews. Hashem wanted to destroy the Jews, destroy the nations. Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the mountain. Forty days he was praying to Hashem. Finally, after the 40th day, Hashem, Moshe figured out the combination to the safe, and he said out loud the 13 attributes of mercy, and he opened the safe of Rachamim, and at that, say, at that same second, Hashem said, and I forgave the nation as you requested. That day, Moshe Rabbeinu went down from the mountain, and that's Yom Kippur. He came down on Yom Shabbat, and that's the day for the rest of the generations, the day of atonement. But this day was called Kippurim, from the word Kippur, Kapara, but it's also saying this day is Kippurim, it's like Purim, meaning that Yom Kippur is, Yom, the, the, day of, the holiday of Purim is even a higher day of atonement. And how do you reach that level of atonement? With the Hester, with this level of Ad Deloyada. Which means that when we want to reverse the entire story that I said in the beginning, that in the beginning the Shekhinah was in this world. When Adam and Chava were in this world, the Shekhinah was batachtonim. Ikar Shekhinah batachtonim. It says in, in Shira Shirim, Bati Legani Achoti Kala. What does it mean, Bati Legani? I, I have returned to my garden. Leganuni, to the garden where I dwelled in. Meaning that in the beginning the Shekhinah was in this world. Ikar Shekhinah batachtonim. The main part of the Shekhinah was in this world. But because of all the sins that started from immorality that we went in the beginning, how Adam and Eve, Adam v'chava and the Nachash and the snake, and then Cain looking at the sister of Evel, he wanted her. It all started, and actually at that time it's when Uzzah and Azel came down. It came... Everything is connected together that all the problems started 
from one major thing, immorality. And we see it throughout all the generations that the thing that all the time was a stumbling block for the Jews is immorality. Every time any nations wanted to to win us, to overpower us, was immorality. When Bil'am came to curse the Jews, he wasn't able to curse them. The only way he was able to somehow affect the Jews is with the Bnot Moab. He's to, he said, you know what? Their God doesn't like immorality. Let's send the girls to seduce the men and we'll make them sin. So through the entire history, we see that all the stumbling blocks always started with immorality and we see that in our generation the one of the major problems is immorality and it trickles to many different places but it all boils down so there were the way to reverse the entire problem that started at the time of creation is only by going to the highest level to the higher source of kapara where can we achieve this atonement and that can only be done in what's the level of Ad Deloya Dao, of Kepurim. And that's with one way, with Hester, with modesty. And this is why the women are exempt from most of the mitzvot. Because the woman corresponds to the Malchut. She, she doesn't need all these mitzvot to, to make these channels, to make these levushim for Hashem. She just needs one thing. She needs to be this levush malchut. When the woman is tznua, when the woman is modest, she becomes this garment of the malchut. She doesn't need to put filin on, she doesn't need to put tzitzit on, she doesn't need to do all the mitzvot. Now it doesn't mean women are exempt, they have to keep Shabbat, they have to eat kosher, they have to pray, they have to give charity, they have to, they have to do mitzvot. But the physical mitzvot that a man is required to do, a woman is not required to do, she only has to do one thing. She has to reach to her essence, which is this hester, this concealment. And this is only achieved with tzniyot. And when a woman is modest, when a woman is modest, not only because the dress is long, and not only because of the way she dresses, the dress is an external part, but also the speech, also the thinking. A lot of women think that modesty is just a dress. No, it's also your thoughts. Your thoughts should be modest. Your talk, your speech should be modest. Your entire house should be modest. Everything is modesty. The thing is that there's a concept in Kabbalah that everything that is not concealed has what's called in the Lashon of Kabbalah, Achizal Achitzonim. It has a place where the other side, this chitzonim, this spiritual negative energy can, grabs, can grab it. If I go now on the street in a very bad neighborhood with a, a stash of cash, I'm going to be robbed right away because, you know, they see it. If I go out in this world and I'm flashing something holy, these chitzonim, the Kabbalah calls it chitzonim, the, 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 the translation to something chitzoni is something that is from the outside, which means that our camp is machanek dusha, the camp of holiness, everything from the outside is unholy, which means everything that is unholy in this world is called something chitzoni, something external. So when I don't want to have these chitzonim have an achiza, then I have to conceal it. One of the reasons why women cover their hair, because in the hair of a woman is kedusha, is holiness, and these chitzonim they want to grab it. They have a chiza on it. That's why a woman covers her hair. That's why actually a man, most orthodox men, they cut their hair because a man's hair has also a chiza for the chitzonim. There's many different things, but the main thing is that we don't want to have for the chitzonim any achiza. Achiza means to grab. And we know, the Gemara says that en adavar, en shora ela badavar asamoy. The bracha, the blessing doesn't dwell only in something that is hidden. If I now go and I flash too much, you know this concept of Ainara, I, I create jealousy, animosity, and anger, and you know, atzneh alechat im Hashem ilokecha. A man also has to be modest. But anything that, if I want my vessel to be pure and I want the, the blessing to be dwelled, it all has to be with tzniyot. It has to be concealed. It doesn't have to be shown. You don't have to show everything. 
That's why a woman only shows her beauty to her husband. The beauty of a woman is saved for the husband. And the thing is, that when a woman doesn't save her beauty only to her husband, she shares it with the world. What happens is, when a woman walking in the street and she's not so modest, she's sharing her beauty with another 500 men, then she's giving out sparks of her neshama out. And what happens is, when it's time to be with her husband and to give the be her beauty to her husband, the husband in the spiritual level feels that he's lacking something. Hey, hey, what? I'm, I'm, I'm lacking something spiritual here. Here it articulates into the physical realm, so maybe the husband will not enjoy being with his wife, or he will be like, okay, I'm missing something here. And that's why you see that in our generations, 60-70% people divorce. Because, not because they don't get along, 500 years ago, people wouldn't get divorced. They would work things out. They wouldn't just run away right away and get divorced. The problem is that in our generation, a lot of women, they, they, they share their beauty. I'm saying share their beauty, but what I mean is they don't cover their beauty. They don't conceal their beauty, and they share it with the world. And what happens is that every eye that looks at them, a piece, a little spark of the neshama is given to that man. So we see if it's a married woman, then later on there's all sorts of frictions with the husband because the husband feels that he's lacking something. I don't have it all. If it's a woman that is not married, then oh, never finds there the shidduch, can't find the shidduch because every man that she sits in the, in the date, he sees some type of, something is missing, he's, something is lacking. And then we see in our generation, this is something new. Well, it's so hard for people to, to find their other half. So the thing is, to kind of sum it all up together, is that we see that any way that Hashem wants to, to, to intervene in this world, He gets dressed in garments, in holy garments. And one of the ways that Hashem intervenes in this world is with the garments of the mitzvot. We explained it before with the mishkan, how the tabernacle had the yeriot, had the, the, the sheets, the same way that the sheets were the garments for the Mishkan, the mitzvot are the garments of the soul. We know Bechlal, that when a person studies Torah in the world to come, that's going to be his mazon, his food, his nourishment. And when a person does mitzvot in the world to come, in Gan Eden and Lama ba, that's going to be his levush, his garment. That's why when a person does half mitzvot, it's very good. But it's almost like me going now to my wedding day with a beautiful tuxedo, and I'm missing a sleeve, and the pocket here is missing, and in the back I'm missing one piece. I did half mitzvot, not all the mitzvot. And in the world to come, when all of us will meet in these spiritual garments, if it's in Gan Eden, then the soul only has garments. At the time of Mashiach, that will happen very soon, we're going to be souls in bodies, we'll still have the garments. So a person who kept all the mitzvot, the garment will be beshlemut, in perfection. And when we're going to see each other, it's going to be like, wow, we're going to be able to see the avodah of each one of us, what they did in this world. I can walk now in the street looking like this. People can look at me, oh, wow, look, he looks very religious. He probably has a lot of mitzvot. It doesn't necessarily always the case. The chitzoniut of, of, in our generation doesn't mean anything. But in the world to come, so much more so in Gan Eden, we only see the real chitzoniyot, we see the mitzvot. Now how it's going to look when a person in the world to come is mi missing some pieces of the garment, missing garments. You know, the Gemara says that the garment is, is respect, is kavod. Why? Not because we need kavod. The Torah teaches us that we don't need kavod. But David the Melech says, Kol kevoda, but melech penima. That the kavod, it's not respect or honor, we don't need that. But the kavod the soul gets at the time of the world to come is the mitzvot. This is the kol kevuda bat melech penima. In this world we don't need kavod. A person who runs after kavod, after honor and respect in this world, you know, it says, the Ramban says, Ba'apo mashpil geim, a person be running after kavod, Hashem makes him a little small in one second. Ramban tells us, Ashpil makom. Make yourself small, make yourself humble, Hashem will make you. Oh, don't worry, Hashem will elevate you. 
the kavod that the Gemara is talking about is at the time of Yemot HaMashiach is what we're going to see is these garments. And that's going to be the honor. Right now, before Mashiach comes, when a soul leaves this world, goes up to Shamaim, all the souls come to greet it. And what do they see? The garments. The garments and they see what the soul achieved in this world. If the soul comes up to Shamaim with beautiful garments, then all the souls marvel what he achieved. And if a soul comes up with some garments, or a lot of garments, but they're dirty from sin, then the souls are like, you know, it's a shame for the soul. But Gan Eden right now is a temporary stop. Very soon Mashiach will come. Very soon after that, we'll have Tchiyat HaMetim. Tchiyat HaMetim, the resurrection of the dead. We're going to have souls in bodies because Gan Eden is the reward to the soul for the mitzvot that he did in the spiritual realm. So when Hashemah goes to Gan Eden, it gets its spiritual reward. But in this world, my body also participated in the mitzvot. My hand put charity. My hand put tefillin. My head wear, wore tefillin on the head. A woman was cutting even a salad for Shabbat. You know, our body participated in the mitzvot. So at the time of Tchiyat Metim, the body gets its sachar. So that's why we're going to have neshamot begufim, souls in bodies. But when are we going to feel this kavod? It's only at the time when, of Mashiach, when it comes, then we're going to see the And the kavod is not going to be what we know in this world. It's what the person achieved in this world. So a man has to do everything with all the mitzvot, but a woman, she has one mitzvah. That's why David HaMelech says, Kol kavodah, the entire kavod, is bat melech penima. It's justice hester, justice tzniut. So a woman has one thing to concentrate and not only she, sur she surpasses the man with all the mitzvot, she's the one who has the ability to go up to this high level the Zohar is talking about, it, this ad deloyada, this tzni'uta, to reverse the problem that initially started. And that's the main part of how important is the modesty of a woman. The same way that we see that what was atoning to the sins on Yom Kippur, a garment. So it all boils down to one thing, is the garments, is what Hashem gets dressed in. This is what the level what you can reverse and atone for all the sins. And the woman has such a high, high level and more, such an important mission because she has the ability to reverse the, the ultimate sin that we're up until today we're praying for. One might say, it's not fair, well, I didn't do the sin 5,000 years ago, why do I have to pay for it? The reality is that that's what it is. We are all what's called the nitzots, a spark from the neshama of Adam Arishon. Adam Arishon made the sin. We have to come here and fix it. So we fix it in many different ways, but the woman has the highest ability to actually fix it. To su sum it all up, because I kept constantly saying that in many different places, there's a hint in, in the connection to Purim, is that when we want to achieve the highest level of atonement, of kapara, is only by tzniot. A man, uh, you know, we, of course we have to do tshuva, we have to do mitzvot, but the highest level that we can achieve, the highest level of atonement of kapara is only tzniot. And if we want to fix and reverse the entire chet of Adam Rishon is only with tzniot. Everything boils down to the same thing is tzniot. Hestel, concealment. And when a woman is walking around the street and in her house and everywhere else and everything is in the, in the fashion of modesty, the way she speaks, the way she thinks, the way she dresses, everything, she's able to reach to the highest level, what is called Eshet Chayl Ateret Ba'ala. She supremes the highest level, she climbs to the highest level. So least to say how important is just to be dressed modest, because you don't want to draw attention to yourself. All the bracha, all the blessing comes to the house from the wife. The children, all the bracha the children get is the wife. The parnasa is the wife. Everything is the wife. A husband can go out and study Torah all day long. Comes on Friday, if the, to if the wife doesn't accept his Torah and his mitzvot on Friday night, on Erev Shabbat when she lights the candles, his Torah is left outside. Everything is the wife. 
It means that if a husband sits all day long in an yeshiva and studies Torah, he has very big sachar. The husband goes and studies Torah for the woman. But on Friday, when Shabbat comes, the woman has to accept the husband into the house. When she lights the candles, you have to have in your thoughts that any Torah that your son and your husband learned, you're welcoming into your house. It's your home. You know how it says in Hebrew on, on a woman, a keret habayit. Not because she mops the floor, because she's ikar habayit. She is the main part of the house. The husband is just a tool. He goes to bring the parnasa, physical parnasa. He goes out to bring also the spiritual parnasa, the Torah that he has to learn and the mitzvot that he has to do. But a woman has the power of accepting the husband or not accepting the husband. If the husband pissed the woman off, excuse my language, and she's upset at him, that man has a problem. But also that, not only that, if the woman and the man, you know, this is something that most people experience, that right before Shabbat, everybody fights. Especially the man and the, the husband and the wife. A half an hour before Shabbat starts the biggest fights. Why can't you fight on Monday? Five minutes before Shabbat, that's when uh, I come home sometimes and that's when I get upset. Why is this like this? Why is this like that? My wife tells me, now, you, now you're getting upset at me. You can't get upset at me on Monday. Why? Because the Nachash, the snake, came between Adam and Chava on Erev Shabbat. He didn't like them. He was jealous. He wanted Chava. He wanted to marry her. Because they were naked. Excuse me how I'm talking about, but Adam and Chava were naked. It says they were Romim, they weren't embarrassed, and they were busy with Provo, multiplying. The Nachash looked at it, he didn't like it. So when the, the whole thing happened on Erev Shabbat, so the Nachash came between them. So right on Erev Shabbat, the Sitra Acha comes between the husband and wife. And there's always going to be fights. And you see that right before Shabbat, always there's a fight. That's why it's a good... A, a good advice for the husband, go out of the house, <laughs> go to shul, pray, study, don't, don't, altitarev, how they say, don't, don't interfere right now. But the thing is that it's very bad for the wife to have anger at the husband on Erev Shabbat. Because if that husband, Bemet, studied a lot of Torah that week, and he did a lot of mitzvot, and a lot of Gwinut Hasadim, and the wife is a little bit upset at him on Erev Shabbat, the Torah doesn't come into the house. When you accept Shabbat, you know that it says in the Zohar that when Hashem wanted to... Uh, how does the whole story started? Mamash in two, two words. All the souls were around Hashem, enjoying what's called the godly revelation, Nehenu Miziva Shechina, they enjoyed this godly revelation, and they kept getting and getting and getting and getting these godly revelations that we can't really understand in our mind what it means, a godly revelation. At some point the souls felt very uncomfortable and they came to Hashem and they told Him, you know what, we feel very embarrassed, you're just giving to us and you're giving to us, and you know the Zohar calls it Nehamad Deksufa, bread of shame, like a poor person that comes to your doorstep and every day, can you give me something to eat? He's embarrassed. So Hashem says, what, what do you want? So the soul says, we want to do something for you. Hashem says, no problem. I'll create a world. I'll put your souls in bodies. I'll give you a list of mitzvot and you're going to earn your sachar, your reward. And then Hashem created the world. Now the souls didn't take Hashem seriously. They're like, no, 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 no. we're joking. But that was already too late. Hashem already created the world. So the thing is that we came down to this world to work for our reward. To get a reward. Now, the whole concept was that there was supposed to be only seven days. Six days of creation. Then came Adam and Chava. Adam and Chava only needed to keep one Shabbat. That's it. All they needed to do, Adam Rishon had to just say, boy kala, boy kala, twice, Shabbat Malkata, that's it, back to where we came from. That's why Adam Arishon wrote the Psalm in Tehilim, Mizmor Shir Leom Shabbat. read the Tehilim, it's, it's very, it kind of explains the whole concept. But the point was that only, he only had to do one little act, and that's it. We'll go back to where we came from. One little sin messed it all up. So the tikkun is why, why, one of the reasons why women light candles on Shabbat, because the woman kibta to Rosh Olam, she diminished the light 
in the world, so now she's relighting it. But one of the real ways of fixing it, this tikkun, is that she's accepting her husband. This is the concept of boikala, boikala, kam the Shabbat, Shabbat markata. The woman has to accept the husband. What does it mean? That in your mind, when you light candles, you're asking Hashem, all the mitzvot that my husband did, let them be mine. All the Torah my husband learned, let it be in the, in the house. If my husband didn't study Torah, then you tell him, you go and study Torah now every day, because your Torah is for the entire house. You know how to go to find a job and to bring money into the house? Go and, and spend an hour a day to learn Torah, to bring this Torah into the house. But if the woman doesn't accept it, the Torah doesn't come into the house. So this is in, 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 in the short version. To kind of sum it up, is that we want to bring back the world to its original state. When Ikar Shechina Batachtonim, when the Shechina is in this world. And one of the ways of making it is by reaching this level. So the main part of a woman is the Tzniyot. And with this Tzniyot, she does this Mishkan for Hashem. She does this Tikkun, this fixing. She's able to reverse the situation with this Tzniyot, with this Hestel. And this corresponds to everything, the way she dresses, the way she talks, the way she thinks, everything. And when a woman does that, she's able to reverse the entire thing. And Bashgaha Pratit, it happened today on our parasha. So this comes to teach us that every one of you that were here should internalize every little detail and say, what am I taking on myself tonight to add another little thing in my midat of tzniyot? Because a lot of people say, oh, I'm already perfect. But David the Melech says, Mi Hashem. We have to constantly, constantly climb. So the whole point of tonight is to make sure that each one of you says, okay, what am I adding in my Midat Tzniyot? And it can be even something little in the house. You know, it can be something so small, it can be personal between you and Hashem. You know, a woman... When she prays, has to cover her hair. If she doesn't cover it regularly, a woman, when she prays, cannot have body parts revealed. If she's walking barefoot in her house, sometimes the adding a little addition is big in the eyes of Hashem. Sometimes the thought can be tzniut. Sometimes the way of talking can be, which is very connected to Lashon Ara, because if a woman is very tznua with her mouth, she's also not going to lichashel in Lashon Ara and not rechilut and all these other things, because the mouth is used to tzniut. So, Mirce Hashem, tonight should be an auspicious time that each one of you can say, okay, what am I adding in my midat tzniut that I can reach to this level of ad deloya dao, this hester, that I can reverse my part and become this mishkan, this dwelling place for Hashem in this world, and the point is to constantly grow and grow and get to a higher level. And with, you know, it says, Bizchut Nashim Tzadkaniot Yatsanu Mimitzrayim. Or Bizchut Nashim Tzadkaniot Nigael. With the merit of righteous women, we left Mitzrayim, Egypt. And with the merit of righteous women, we're going to merit the new Gula, the ultimate Gula that is right in the doorstep. Step. So each and any, every one of you has the, the Mechuyavut, the obligation to say, what am I doing to hasten the Geula? And yes, I'm going to become more religious in my thoughts and my acts, but my main thing is where I'm becoming more tznu'ah. So I wish you great success in all your ways. And I wish you great koach to elevate yourself into this level.